Hello and Hare Krishna. Welcome to today's Chasing Reality podcast episode with me, Ryan, aka Ramananda Das. We are joined today by Sharon for Hewitt Rowlett, who is based in Washington, DC. She's a philosopher, um, specializes in metaethics, metaphysics, um, epistemology. And so she's written a recent book, which is called The Source and Significance of Coincidences split into two parts. The first part, part is about the source of coincidences, and the second part is about the significance of coincidences. A very, very comprehensive scholarly book infused with, infused with her own experiences as well as anecdotes from others. It's, it's a very whole book, and I really recommend you read it because um, I think it's, 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 she's really onto something, and I think it could be very beneficial. Um, okay, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy this podcast. So thank you very much to Sharon for joining us today. Yes. Um, I, I'm really interested in your book. I, I read, I have a confession. I, I read most of it, but I haven't got through potentially the most important part, which is the second part, um, the significance. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a I'm, long book. I'm, it is. I could tell us so much incredible effort went into it. The name... Um, I haven't actually got the, the hard copy, it's an e-copy, but the name for, for anyone listening is the source of significance, the, sorry, the source and significance of coincidences. Here, I've got a copy I can put up here. So oh, thank you. There we go. Beautiful. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I know your background is in, um, well, from what I read on the website, it's in philosophy, metaethics, metaphysics, yes. um, epistemology. So Maybe you could just tell us how you got into this in, um, in, into the, the, the field of coincidences, because it's a fascinating one, which I'm sure many people are interested in. Um, well, I think I got into it the way a lot of people get into these sort of um, strange topics, uh, which is through personal experience. Uh, so I think, you know, all of us have, you know, little coincidences that happen to us now and then, and that had kind of been you know, my experience for most of my life, you know, every now and then something would happen and be like, Oh, well, isn't that strange? But it wasn't enough to really make me, you know, try to research the topic. But then a few years ago, I had this one coincidence experience that was so just in your face that I was like, I have to understand what's going on here. This is mm-hmm. not just chance. Um, so what happened in this this case this is actually the one that I start the book off with. Um, I was in Pennsylvania visiting some friends um, for a weekend, and that weekend, for various reasons, I was thinking a lot about the country of France where I used to live, and I was thinking a lot about um, one of my friends that I had had while I was there in France. And so this whole weekend, I'm kind of you know, thinking about this in the back of my mind while I'm talking to my friends. One afternoon, we go out um, driving around trying to find a grocery store to get some food. And because we don't know the area very well, uh, the friend who's driving with me decides to use her phone to find a Mm -hmm. grocery store. And so she gives it a voice command, you know, find the nearest grocery stores. And then she hands the phone to me um, because she's driving and she wants me to kind of direct her to the nearest one. So I look at the phone. It's showing me a list of grocery stores in Pennsylvania where we are. Um, and then I click map because I want to see them, uh, see which one is closest. When the map comes up on this mm-hmm. phone, it's showing me towns in France. Oh. All of these <laughs> French sounding place names. Uh, and one of them I particularly remembered from my time in France, the town of Carré. I couldn't remember exactly where it was in France, but I knew that it was a French town. So I just kind of was like, I don't know why this phone suddenly thinks that we're in France, but that's weird since I've been obsessing about France this whole weekend. Uh, but I give the phone back to my friend and it starts working normally for her, uh, shows us a map of Pennsylvania. And so we go find the grocery stores. Well, Uh, A few days later, when I get home, I'm interested to see where in France Carré is. So I Google that, and it turns out that it's in the region of France, Brittany, where my friend 
uh, lived. It wasn't um, real close to where he lived, but it was in that region. And so I was like, well, mm -hmm. that's also very interesting. Yeah. And I just had this, this feeling. I was like, this is such a strong coincidence. I bet that the place that this phone was showing me was the place where he happened to be on that day. So <laughs> just you know it was like the middle of the night i i couldn't ask him you know where he was and i hadn't talked to him for some time um so it would have been a little bit strange anyway but i i googled uh his name and i googled the day that this coincidence had happened and lo and behold up pops this page from his blog where he says where he's going to be on a few different days that year and it shows that on that particular day he was two miles from the center of Cahe. Wow. So if he, if he on that day had, you know, been looking at his phone, trying to find grocery stores, the map that it would have shown him would have included that grocery store that I saw in Pennsylvania. It was just so, so strange. It's just so perfectly connected to all of the thoughts that had been going through my mind on that day. And I was like, I've got to find out if this has happened to other people you know, what could explain this kind of an event? Well, I'm sure many people are going to be thankful that um, you had that experience because um, you wrote such an incredible book based on it. I mean, that must have, t that must have taken a very long time to do that research. It's seriously, it's, it's a serious book. It did. Um, it took, I guess, so, I mean, I had been, I've been, you know, somewhat interested in the topic maybe for, maybe two or three years before the, the GPS coincidence happened. And then I started just actively reading everything I could get my hands on on the topic. And that research, you know, took another three years. Um, so, yeah. So you, you don't, um, I assume you don't conclude now that it, that it was chance? No, no, I don't think, I don't think chance is a very good explanation for that. Um, and besides just the sheer improbability and I, I have you know a whole chapter in my book going into how to um, calculate the probability of various coincidences um, but apart from the sheer improbability of it the other thing that makes me believe that there's something more at work there is the emotional impact that it had on me um, it, it came at a very important time in my life. And in fact, uh, that coincidence was followed uh, by a series of other coincidences that eventually led me to, to get back in touch with this friend of mine in France. And I discovered that something really important had happened in his life recently. He'd actually had his first child um, oh, just okay. a, a few days after the GPS coincidence. Uh, and so that's something that I wouldn't have known about if I hadn't gotten in touch with him. And it was a very a very positive um, exchange that we had and a very important for my life. And this is a pattern that we, that I've found in a lot of other people's coincidence stories is that the really strong coincidences will arrive at um, moments of um, important change or emotionally significant points in people's lives, almost like they're just, like, I mean, there are a couple different ways you could interpret it. It could be, um, you know, like a kind of a wink from the universe saying, yeah, mm -hmm. we know what's going on. Like, this is, this is all, you know, part of the plan. Um, I also think there's another interesting way of interpreting it, which is that we, we actually influence the course of events in the world around us and particularly when we have a strong emotional investment in something, um, we have a stronger influence on the world. And so that's another way that you could explain why these coincidences tend to happen at important turning points in people's lives. Okay, so from, from what you've got, I, I understand you're saying it could be um, one of two things, maybe both, that there's something to do with us, which is causing something to happen external to us or there could be something external to us which is showing us 
hey, it's okay, you know, some kind of lesson or, 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 or journey that we've, we've been put on. Um, well, I, I'm interested in, in that first one that I just mentioned to do with, um, well, let's start there anyway. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it, uh, consciousness is a, is, a, is a particular topic that's close to my, close to my heart. <laughs> um, and so it, it, I'm, I'm not a philosopher of mind or anything like that. And I'm not so, so intricately involved in, in these things at an academic level, but I'm, I, I, I'm a practicing, um, I'm a, a practicing uh, Bhagavad Vedantist, you could call it. The short name is Hare Krishna. <laughs> um, and and it, from, from what I've been reading, consciousness is such a, an important topic, but it, I don't see it addressed so much in academic circles. That's why I was really interested to see it in your book in such an open way that embraces the, the potential for, for the obvious, which is that mm. we're, we're actually just conscious beings. So I wanted to get your understanding as to, to what are your thoughts about the, the consciousness and what actually is it? Sorry, that's a hard one straight off. The... Yeah, no, it is. But, but it is getting to the root of the problem, I think, and to the, the root of what's most interesting about coincidences and so many other strange phenomena that we experience. It's kind of funny, it's kind of ironic that it's difficult to define, co uh, define consciousness because it's the thing that in some ways is the most immediate to us. I mean, we're in every moment of our lives that, that we remember, we, we are conscious, you know, we're constantly experiencing consciousness. So it's something that's it's almost so familiar to us that it's hard to put our finger on what it, exactly it is. Um, I think I think that consciousness is actually a lot more all encompassing than the current scientific worldview um, acknowledges mm -hmm. because I, if you think about it everything everything that you've ever experienced in your life anything that anyone has ever experienced uh, no matter whether it's you know daily life or it's a scientific experiment that's being conducted in a laboratory um, all of those experiments or the those experimental results come to you through consciousness so we we have this idea of a physical world existing independently of us but in fact all the knowledge that we have of that world is filtered through our own consciousness. Yes. So we, we actually don't have any straightforward evidence for a physical world that exists independently of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of, um, what, one of the arguments for a physical world that exists outside of the realm of consciousness is all of these regularities that we notice in our consciousness so we see you know we wake up this morning and we see this basically the same world that you know existed when we went to sleep last night and so we think well it makes sense that there is this world that's out there that i'm experiencing again i'm coming into contact with that world again and that's why it seems to stay the same or relatively yeah. you know similar all of the time But at the same time, we don't have, it could be that these regularities in our experience are not caused by something that is, you know, material or physical in the way that we normally think of it. They might be regularities that are caused by something else. For instance, when we are, when you play a video game, you are inside of a world that has certain regularities to the, you know, the way it operates, you can, you know, go into the same room or the same area again, and it will look basically the same as it did last time. But it's not because that room actually exists physically. It's because there's, you know, computer code that creates that same experience again and again for you. And so it might be that there's some kind of program or code that creates 
our conscious experience and creates those patterns in it that look like, you know, an independent world, but are really just patterns in our consciousness. It's what came to mind as you, you were speaking, and, and I like to use this, this analogy. I'm not sure if you would agree, but um, the way I see the world is, is as a, um, like a virtual reality almost. That's the best analogy I can think of. So I'm experiencing qualia or some qualitative experience, but I don't actually know what's out there as the, the substance. It could be code, as you said. I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what it is. Is that, was that kind of, does that match that analogy to what you were saying or is it something slightly different? Yeah, yeah, that's the, exactly the kind of idea I'm getting at. Um, yeah, we've, yeah, we're having an experience as of a world that's independent of us, but we don't know for sure whether it is or not. And we actually have, we have some hints in coincidences like, you know, this GPS incident that I experienced or, you know, all different um, ex extraordinary experiences that people have that maybe there's a little bit more going on here and maybe our minds are connected to the creation of our experiences um, um, maybe there's a closer connection between those things than we than we realize normally okay yeah i saw this in your book um the, the princeton um the pair experiments princeton anomalous no princeton engineering anomalous research institute with robert dunn and janice right um, janice dunn and uh, brenda robert dunn john. and robert john yeah yes and um and, and I noticed you, you were quoting them as many, many other different sources as well. And I know, at least from, from them, that their research has indicated that um, consciousness can affect matter, can, can affect the physical world and these quantum yes. tunneling machines. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that their research is a great, it's a great way of showing that we can reproduce these kinds of experiences in a laboratory now generally in the laboratory you don't see them as you know blatantly or you know as um, amazingly as you do in um, everyday life situations uh, partly because i think the emotional component isn't there um, the sorts of experiment experiments that john and dunn uh, were doing were having people try to influence uh, random number generators, excuse me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> try to influence random number generators or the way that um, uh, these balls would fall in a, um, like a cascade that was set up to be perfectly random, um, but they would try to make more balls fall to one side rather than the other. Um, right. And then they would switch it and say, okay, now try to make them fall on this side rather than that side. So it's, I mean, it can be fun and interesting, but it's not something that the, uh, the subjects have a great emotional investment in. Um, so the effects that they're going to see um, and that they did see were quite small in each individual case, but they did so many experiments over, you know, almost 30 years uh, that cumulatively you can see there's very strong statistical significance to the results that they got in the direction of people actually having some kind of effect on these random, or supposedly random physical processes. Go ahead. Oh, no, did you want to say something? Uh, well, I was just going to mention that one of, I think the most fascinating um, experiment that came out of the pair lab, for me at least, you know, being interested in coincidences and all the sources that these coincidences can come from, the most interesting experiment was, um, or set of experiments, was where they had people work in pairs to try to influence the machine. So people would work together. And what they discovered is that there wasn't uh, much of an effect when you, you would just pair up random people. But if you put together two people that had a strong emotional connection to one another, they weren't just, they didn't have just like two times more of an effect on these random processes. They had nearly seven times stronger an effect on the processes. Hmm which is another indication that the that emotion and maybe 
you know, um, you know, human bonds between people have some kind of effect on how this process is taking place that enables us to, to influence the physical world. It's just, it's fascinating. We're, we're, we're really in the beginning stages of all of this research. There's so much out there to investigate, but the, the experiments that have been done so far are just so intriguing. There's so many different things to, to investigate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess you've got many years to keep you busy. Um, <laughs> <I think so. laughs> because th these questions, I mean, we're barely even, from what I've understood, we're barely even scratching scratching the how questions or the what's actually happening. Let alone the the why. Well, why does that? Why is it that a group effect? You know, ontologically speaking, well, why is it that a group effect would have? Um, and especially if there's co-aligned intentions, why would why would that have? Um, more of an effect on you know on influencing matter um yeah it's, it's fascinating actually that, that brings me to a question about psychokinesis i think it's the pk psychokinesis mm -hmm. i noted in your book um there was a, there was a point where you mentioned about passive volition or release of effort and you, people get better results from that um mm -hmm. in terms of trying to influence things and i just wondered about that so I can't remember whether there was any um, particular study done by the pair lab or anywhere else that, that specifically focused on this. I think there might've been one or two out there, um, mm -hmm. but I uh, primarily, I just recognized this pattern in all of the different um, people's different experiences that I read through from so many different sources over and over again, people would mention, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about this and trying, you know, you know, figuring they had some kind of psychokinetic connection to the world. They were trying to make this thing happen, but if they were, you know, trying too hard, they wouldn't get any results. But then it was like, as soon as they gave up and moved on to something else, <laughs> suddenly something would happen. Wow. So there's, there's this need for some kind of focus, but you don't want to get maybe to the level of, of of stressing over it or um yeah i don't know if it's the stress or it's the effort or what it is but there's you need to have the goal very clearly before you but then you also need this detachment from it um oh that's very interesting that's a very interesting way of looking at it because one of the core teachings that not, not to spin this around to me but one of, it resonates what you're saying because one of the core teachings of the bhagavad gita is to do your um to do to do whatever is your 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 duty in life because she's born out of your nature so so whatever my nature is my propensities are born out of that so i do that but i'm not attached to the result so i just mm. try and marae equipoise so i do it but then which is interesting because it, it, it it's very much in line with this idea of just trying too hard i'm trying to control everything the situation and rather than just relaxing into it and saying okay i'll do my best and whatever happens you know that's kind of out so not to me really yeah, the, I think the parallels there are really close. And another um, source for this that I, comes to mind is another recent book that was written on coincidences, um, Sky Nelson Isaac's book, Living in Flow. He's a, a physicist who talks about, um, uh, he has a particular um, physical theory pertaining to how coincidences and synchronicities occur. And let me think where I was going with this. Oh, so part of his theory is this focus on the goal being more important than the way that you get there. Um, and that it's, it's your focus on actually the experience that you want to produce in the end that's what's most effective. And that it's easier for the, the physical world to organize itself. Uh, he, he thinks this happens at the quantum level, but he thinks, you know, it's easier for the, the quantum world to organize itself to bring about that goal um, if it has as many possible routes to get there as possible. So if you're, if you're focused on producing your goal in this one specific way, it's mm -hmm. going to be harder 
for the universe to produce it because there, you're saying, well, there's just one path that I want to get there. Whereas if you just, you know, give the universe your goal, then it could use any of the paths available to it, whatever is sort of would cause the fewest ripples elsewhere. And it can just produce it that way. So maybe this idea of detachment and kind of not thinking too hard about the problem has an effect because it is this, this quantum process that kind of needs to operate on its own to find the best route to the goal that you've set for it. That's it's very a, interesting. Yeah. It, yeah, I think, I think his theory has a lot of, a lot of promise too. I think, I think we should definitely work on, on developing that more and, and, and seeing what sorts of testable, um, uh, testable implications it might have. Yes, because it's, it, it's, it's allowing, it's, it seems to me you're saying that his, his work is saying, okay, so, um, you know, you, you want to go somewhere and if you just kind of fixed upon one way of doing it, then you're not really giving much opportunity, much flexibility of, of how you get there. But if you just say, well, here's the goal and, you know, I'm sure there are many ways of getting there and you're open to, to experiencing different ways of getting there, then you just have so many more possibilities, um, which means ultimately in a time space, I imagine it's more likely to to happen because you could, you could you, you're more flexible. You can go down one route or the other route. And yeah, I like this one. I like yeah. you're putting it in terms of flexibility. That I think that's exactly exactly it. Um, it it's completely the reverse of the way we normally think about achieving goals. When I mean, we think, okay, I've got to do this step, and then that will allow me to do this step, and this step, and this step. But this seems to be a process that works in the reverse fashion, and we have to start with the goal and then allow it to find its its way back to us in a sense. Yeah, so the universe may be more counterintuitive than we, <laughs> <laughs> than we ever yeah. imagined. <laughs> <laughs> I have got a, I've got some, I've got loads of questions. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. I don't know what order they're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, throw them out um, there. We'll... Okay. Um, okay, so where are we? Hmm, let me think. Oh, yes, I wanted to ask you. This is this is more of a personal question. I noticed in your book you mentioned about going from um, being um, being born a Baptist, being very serious and, and studying, and and then you went through an experience. Um, maybe you could just tell us a bit about that, rather than me say it, because I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I grew up um, in a Baptist church um, and was very committed to the religion that I grew up in and um, it was it was very important to me I spent a lot of time and in, invested in it um, and then I went to a Christian college uh, and while I was in college I took um, some philosophy classes I, I took you know a lot of the things you take when you go to college that you know encourage you to think about the world in different ways mm -hmm. than you're used to thinking about it and I just I got to the point where I, I, for the first time, I could imagine that there was a world without God in it. And I was like, oh, this is what the atheists have been thinking all along. How do I know that this isn't true? And I, it, it hit me that I felt like, well, there's nothing that has actually happened to me in my life that makes clear that God does exist. I've always thought that he did, but I don't have any hard evidence that God is there. And this was a really difficult revelation for me because, I mean, my whole life was invested in this, you know, I was at a Christian college, so all my friends, everybody was Christian, and it was a pretty scary thing to question all of that. But I honestly felt like I didn't have much of a choice um, because I felt like I have to follow the evidence where it leads. Uh, so I spent a lot of time praying to God, asking for God to give me some kind of sign that he, he did exist. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, pray and pray and pray and cry over it and all of this stuff. And nothing happened. You know, there was, I felt like there was no sign, no evidence, nothing. So I became an atheist. It's like, well, I can't reasonably, you know, 
I, I just don't believe that God is there because he didn't answer me. Uh, so for about 10 years, um, I was an atheist or at least an agnostic, um, depending on what day you asked me. Um, and after about 10 years, I went through a difficult time in my life. And during that time, um, uh, this is a, I had a, uh, like a relationship breakup and it was really devastating. And during that time, I started to have these weird coincidences or quote unquote signs that would just pop out of nowhere that were very reassuring to me during this time when I felt, you know, so um, lost. And that they were exactly the kind of thing that I had been begging God for, you know, 10 years before. I was like, well, why are these things suddenly popping been? up now? What is, <laughs> what's going on? Does, I mean, what, what does this mean? Um, and eventually it was those those coincidences you know accumulating over time that led me to believe that you know there is some kind of intelligence um intelligence above my own you know limited intelligence in this world that's that's directing what's going on in this world uh so whether we call that god or we call it something else there's there is some higher intelligence out there uh but I did wonder to myself, like, why didn't that intelligence manifest itself 10 years ago when I was so, you know, sad? And I realized that if I had gotten these coincidences or these signs back then when I was at my Christian college, I would have automatically concluded that that meant that the God that I had been brought up to believe in was the God who existed. And I needed the next 10 years to continue to broaden my mind and broaden my perspective so that when these things started happening in my life, I would understand that it didn't necessarily mean that any one particular religion was true. And I would be able to investigate with a more open mind what exactly this, this force was that was creating these experiences for me. That's fascinating because, um, again, the counterintuitive thing, um, you know, if there's, if there's someone, you know, a God or a higher intelligence, I'm not sure how we're going to term it, but right. um, they will guide you away from religion, almost kind of not away from religion, but away from being too fixated upon maybe um, a certain religion. Is that, is that what you are? Yeah, I think that, I feel like that's exactly what happened, that I needed I needed to be an atheist. You know, I needed to reject religion and those ways of thinking for many years in order to be able to come to what I feel is a better understanding of the way the, the world works now. Um, yeah. It, 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 does be, it does beg a question, um, <laughs> which is, well, I was going to ask you, where are you, where are you at now? And... Um, how do you see religions? Because in, in your book, you mention a lot of um, coincidences coming from different, um, different, uh, different frames of reference, religious or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I, yeah, I'm just inter interested to kind of understand your, your perspective on that now. So, yeah, the, what I mentioned in the book is how many of these coincidences and um, other kinds of extraordinary human experiences like near-death experiences or miraculous healings, all of these, they will happen to people in lots of different religions and lots of different uh, belief systems. Um, and so because of that, I feel like we can't say, you know, this belief system has it right this belief system doesn't i think that probably some some religious systems are a little bit closer to the truth than others but i don't know which ones those are um i don't think i don't think anybody does i think we're all we're all seeking um or many of us are seeking for that truth and we're you know we're coming from it from a very limited 
perspective. We're coming to it from our own, you know, our own background, the, the culture that we grew up in, the, the cultures and that we've experienced, you know, in our adulthood. And we're trying to, trying to figure out what's going on. And I think, I think that, that, that journey towards the truth does have to be very individual for people. I don't, I think that there is a place for many different religions, many different ways of seeking the ultimate truth about the world and about who we are and our place in that world. Um, and different, different faith traditions can be really helpful to different people and can be, different traditions can be forces for good in the world. Um, as for me, myself, I, I don't identify with any one particular tradition as far as, as far as metaphysical beliefs. Um, I still have a, a strong emotional attachment to Christianity. Um, and so when I tend to think about spiritual concepts, uh, I'll think, think about them first in Christian terms. Um, that just make, that's more familiar to me. But I think that the truth is so much bigger than any one system can capture. Um, because I'm, it, faith traditions are ultimately human practices. They're, you know, human records, you know, in the Bible or whatever scriptures you use. The, they've been created by people who probably have had very strong um, spiritual encounters with this higher intelligence, whatever it is. Um, so I think there's, there's an important core of truth in a lot of these scriptures, but it's almost like it's important for people who are seeking not to rely so much on what has been said or you know, written down about spirituality, but to seek out the experience themselves, to seek out this, this mind that is, that is greater than we are, and to, tr to try to experience that personally and individually. It's so hard to put into words, <laughs> all of this stuff, but, but I, I just, I really think that it has to be very personal. It has to be about the personal experience of it because that's where you're going to learn the most important truths for yourself. Thank you. I, I really like that, the way you phrased it. I, I, if I can try and encapsulate it in, in how I received it in my mind and see if that was right. I, I thought you were saying that there's, there's an importance, you know, that, that religions can be important and different traditions to different people and maybe at different times. For example, you went through a certain tradition, which is Christianity or in the Baptist particular branch. And then you went through another tradition, maybe philosophical tradition of atheism, <laughs> just I suppose. Um, um, so, so then there are just different things at different times. They're almost tools to be able to connect personally mm. with something which is way beyond what we're really able to conceive. So, um, it's fascinating because your experience um, of, of turning to, to atheism, you know, what kind of God does that? But when you put it in all kind of higher intelligence, stuff, but when you put it in a higher context, um, it is very personal, like you said. I like that, that idea that, it, you know, when, when I look around the world, everything is very personal. It's just dealing with other people. So in, in, I can really understand where you're coming from because... What else could it be if it wasn't personal? So, so that's a really mm. nice way to approach spiritual life. Um, I like how you talked about the, the philosophical tradition of atheism as, as, you know, being another religious path, because I think that we think of religion as having to have, you know, belief in a God, but, but I think the opposite belief, the belief that there is no God is also a religious commitment of a sort. Um, mm -hmm. And and it can be a, a religious commitment that is very helpful to certain people in their development, as it was to me. So, yeah. 
Yes, I, I am. I was wondering if I think you alluded to it just now, as, as you said in your development. I personally feel like I've I've been on a on a journey, a kind of almost semi-guided journey. A part of me feel, feels like I've been doing it, but another part feels like you know I look back retrospectively and think there's some weird stuff that, that <laughs> happened that <laughs> that just seemed to align in incredible coincidence. Um, so you have had some, I, some guiding coincidences at important points. Yes, I, I definitely have. Can I can I tell you one? And you can, I, I would you love can anal to analyze yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was on. I, I'll, t I'll tell you my. I'll tell you my story. I love. I lo everyone loves telling their story, don't they? Yeah. Um, so I was, um, and I don't usually get to tell people about this because usually it's just like talking about biology or something. <laughs> but I can tell you. Um, so I, I was working in sales. I was. I was kind of miserable after a while driving around the country and I started listening to audible you know this uh, audible.com mm -hmm. that wasn't an advert I was just a <laughs> and um and so I was listening to different um positive thinking audios and then I somehow I just moved on to Buddhism and then I went on a retreat which really freaked me out because I thought I was gonna be loads of monks but then I just started moving. It was, it was amazing. I had this amazing time and I realized I've got a mind. I didn't know it till then. I could visualize things. I, I had no idea until I tried meditation. Um, <laughs> then somehow got on to Hinduism and Ramdas and all these guys. Um, ended up doing some pretty radical things with hallucinogenics. Um, but then over, over like the period of fi five years, I'd collected about four or five books, which I just didn't want to get rid of. Um, and I've gotten from different places, but I never knew who the author was. I never knew what they're about. I just knew it was something spiritual. So they're on my bookshelf, and I had this real yearning to be part of a spiritual community. So I went to the closest place to London, and it just turned out to be a Hare Krishna temple. And I didn't even know what that was. I just went to volunteer on the farm. But at the time when I turned up, I was reading the book, um, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, Mm -hmm. Now, there are many versions of the Bhagavad Gita and many authors. I didn't know the Bhagavad Gita had anything to do with the Hare Krishna temple. And the particular author was was the founder of this branch of, you know, the temple and, and, and that mm -hmm. specific book. So I was reading it and then I went to a few classes in the evening after being on the farm and realized, oh, they're talking about this thing that I'm reading. And then I went back home for the weekend. I found these five books from the same author. Um, which had been collecting on my bookshelf for five years. Um, and it was just, I mean, it, it wasn't, it, it kind of helped me. I didn't see it as mm -hmm. like, oh, this is it, this is, but I, I saw it as very much um, a sign that I was moving in the right direction. But I wanted to get your feedback on it because it's, um, well, it's a coincidence. There's lots of coincidences. It is. It is. It's like the the universe gave you the library that you needed before you knew that you needed it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, like you said, it's not like you experienced and, and, you know, you immediately took it as, you know, a sign that this is what you needed to do. But at the same time, it, it sounds like it was reassuring to you in a sense, like, oh, it's sort of. Yeah, this is this is the direction I'm supposed to be going. It's not like you you know you gave up any sense of personal agency over it. You know, you were still yeah. making a decision about it, and you realized, yeah, I'm going to make a decision to move in this direction. But it maybe seemed it seemed obvious to you that this is what you needed to do because here you had these books, and here were the people you know who were connected to the author of the books, and and why shouldn't you do this? It's like mm -hmm. the universe was handing it to you on a silver platter, and why would you say no? <laughs> Voila. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, one of the things that I try to do in my book is help people to kind of to find that that healthy way of responding to coincidences. Because it sounds like you you responded in a in a healthy way to to that, and it, it's led you in a positive direction. It seems like mm -hmm. you know you found a community that is really um, that really works for you and, you know, it allows you to become the person you were supposed to be, um, and in this world. And I think there's, there's sort of this, this spectrum of 
reactions that people can have to coincidences. Um, you know, you can have the people that just dismiss them as, well, it's not important. It's just chance. Um, they don't want, they don't take them into account whatsoever. Um, and then you have at the other end of the spectrum, um, people who are, are looking to coincidences to tell them what to do because they have no idea what to do mm-hmm. with their life otherwise, or, or maybe, you know, they, they know what to do, but they don't want to do. <laughs> so they're looking for a coincidence to, you know, justify them moving in a different direction, maybe. Um, but so they're, they're trying to give coincidences all of this power in their life. And I think we have to find this balance in the middle. We have to be sensitive to the coincidences around us because I think we can learn so much from them. Uh, but we also have to take personal responsibility for our reactions to them and know that we are still making a choice about what to do in response to them. Especially if we're, you know, what we were saying earlier in our conversation about our ability to affect the world around us, especially if that is true, that we are affecting the physical world, that we're affecting the events that come into our lives, Mm -hmm. then we need to to view every coincidence with a little bit of, um, with, with the awareness that we may ourselves have produced that. So it's not necessarily a sign from, you know, the universe or, or God, but it might just be a reflection of the things that are going on in our mind. And so it can be useful. It can be very useful for us to be aware of what's going on in our mind. It, it, the way that it, it's useful for us to pay attention to our dreams, because a lot of times they'll tell us about things that we're maybe worried about or, or maybe we'll provide solutions to problems that we hadn't thought of in waking life. But they let, they let us kind of know what's going on behind the scenes in our mind. And I think coincidences can serve that very same purpose. So we can, it's good to be aware of them because they help us understand our own thought processes, our own emotions or desires. Uh, but we also have to realize that they may just be reflections of us and they're not necessarily telling you this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. Just here's what you're thinking. Now make a decision. (laughs) Yes. I I like the way you're, you're very responsible way of talking about um, coincidences. It's it's one of the things I was hoping we would get to in this call because I've noticed in myself, it is possible to become um, desirous of, of certain things and to become more passive because you, and, and like you said it's just a the balance is to be decisive um in taking action and when coincidences coincidences come up maybe they're like little the way i imagined it as you were speaking they're like little flags on a highway you know or little um posts it's like okay i'm going the wrong direction going the right direction but it's not like i'm into, i know where i'm going i've got my sat nav or something but i'm not entirely focused on them i'm they're just kind of there Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's kind of like they're, when you see those coincidences, like you saw, you know, the books in your library um, connected to Hare Krishna, there's, they're letting you know that you're moving in alignment with your, your deeper self, your deeper goals. Uh, so when the coincidences are lining up with what you have a strong intuitive conviction about, then you know, it just lets you know, yes, you're on the right path. Just keep going. But if you keep experiencing coincidences that are at odds with what you're trying to to do in your life, then it's maybe time to reevaluate and say, well, do I really want to do this, to go down this path? Is there a part of me that's like trying to to turn me in a different direction? And so you need to do a little bit more reflection then. Have you got an example of, of that one? Um, of like coincidences to redirect you? Yes. Um, so this, this example is more like blatant psychokinesis than it is coincidence, but I think it illustrates the point well. So um, this is a, a case that was collected by... Um, a psychiatrist, uh, Joel Witten, he's a Canadian uh, psychiatrist. And he talks about this woman who came to him 
because she woke up one morning in her apartment um, and saw that there were these weird red splotches on her wall that looked kind of like blood, um, but they just kind of came out of nowhere. She lived by herself, so it wasn't like there was somebody else who could have made these in the night, but she woke up and there were these weird splotches. Um, and over the, you know, the course of uh, a few days, more of them were appearing. And finally, the splotches uh, started appearing on um, the top of this dollhouse that she had sitting in her living room. Mm. And that was when she got really, really freaked out and decided to go talk to somebody about what was going on. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, Dr. Witten, in talking to her, uncovered the fact that several months before she had been pregnant and she had decided that it wasn't the right time for her to have a baby and so she had scheduled an abortion when she went to have the abortion it turned out that she had already miscarried so that the fetus had already died um but what dr witten discovered in her medical records was that the day that these red splotches started appearing in her home was the due date of that child what, what would have been the due date if it had, had lived and so he was talking to her about you know this seems to be an expression of your maybe your guilt over rejecting that pregnancy um and just some unfinished business that you have with this event that happened mm -hmm. to you in the past and he pointed out um in his account of this case that when these splotches started appearing on the wall she didn't scrub them off oh. she just left them there and so he said you know they were you wanted to be reminded of this you wanted to not just have it you know pushed out of your mind you wanted to have to confront it and to to come to a better understanding of what had happened and to heal from that experience so i think it, it you know coincidences in a less blatant way a less um, paranormal way can do the same thing for us okay so the so this the, the lady um who was experiencing the you know coming home and seeing these notches on the walls i, I understand that that's basically that that was coming about because of um some something inside of her which was repressed or maybe um how, how would you say that something she she, she uh, subconsciously or whatever we want to call that wanted to work on mm -hmm. but and so that's why she wasn't actually removing them from the wall um, yeah because there's some, you know. yeah I think it was a way for her subconscious to talk to her in a way like is she, th th this is just me you know um, guessing at this point um, but you know she might have been repressing those thoughts about what had happened because they were, you know, maybe too painful for her to deal with or what have you. So she, she wasn't letting them into her consciousness. And so mm -hmm. at some point her subconscious said, okay, well, I'm going to put this stuff on the wall and then you'll be forced to think about this, you know, and especially when it, you know, the red splotches appeared on the dollhouse, you know, this connection to a child yeah. um, really made that connection stronger for her and made her go and talk to a doctor about it to seek out some kind of help. And he helped her make that conscious connection with her experience. That's an incredible story, but, but I do have a question, mm -hmm. which I think everyone's probably wondering if any, you know, when people listen to this, um, where did those blotches come from? It, was, was it that yeah. she was going and like yeah. didn't know she was in a dream and she oh. was kind of putting them on the wall? So, so one important aspect of the case is that, um, she had a friend who also saw the splotches and one day her friend came to pick her up and take her to the movies. So her friend came, saw the splotches that were on the wall. They went out to the movies, they came back and there were new splotches on the wall. So that that's the one aspect of the case that makes it seem like it was not something that she was kind of doing her, you know, in a, a normal way in a dissociated state. It seems like mm -hmm. it was actually something psychokinetic going on. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's incredible because 
you know, we always hear, you know, uh, what's what's the phrase, you know, when you uh, you kind of got skeletons in the closet, you know, and put, putting the oh. putting the dirt, just putting the dirt all out on display, put out, you know, laying out your laundry or whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. but that brings it to a different level. It's like spontaneous um, generation of your laundry for, it, for yeah. <laughs> on your wall. Yeah, be careful what you think about because it might, or be careful what you're repressing because it might come out where everyone can see it. Uh, I have a friend who likes, um, he, he likes the rice experiment. You know the rice experiment? Mm, remind me. Well, you, you talk to the rice. So you cook the rice, you split it into three, and then you um, you just leave one as a control. And then the other one, you just, you're nice to it, you know, hey, how you doing? Thank you. Gr- gratitude. You're so lovely, nourishing me, etc. And then the third one, you just, you just, if you've had a bad day, it's even better. You just take it out on it swearing shouting he said he could only do it for a few weeks because he felt so guilty but um <laughs> but he's rice. had them now <laughs> i know poor rice <laughs> um yeah. but, but, but he's had them now for years and years um and he takes photos periodically and it is it is fascinating i mean it's just a single experiment but i know this has been repeated in various different ways for plants and all sorts living organisms mm-hmm. and um yeah i hadn't heard of it being done with rice actually because you're the first person to tell me about that yeah it's it's incredible i mean it, it the the photos as you, you see the last one the, the one you're kind of angry at is just sludge complete sludge whereas the what interesting is even though they haven't they've been at room temperature for years the one he was nice to is still it should be a lot more degraded <laughs> that's the fascinating thing yeah. so um yeah in, interesting there's so many of these experiments and i, I hope they they continue you know i'm, I'm it's, it sounds like it's a resurgence of um, I mean, if philosophers are talking about it, then 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 there's then maybe there's 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 more room for it to become acceptable because yeah, maybe science, there's hope. There's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think that was that was most of my most of my my main questions. Is there are there any kind of messages that you would like to to give out there? Because it's such I I want to urge everyone to read it. It's an incredible book. So. But anything you would like to say from your experiences writing it and and the process of it that you'd want, like to share? I think that for me, the main lesson that I took from all of the research that I did and, and the main message that I was trying to convey in this book is that we've got to keep our minds open about what's going on in these cases. Um, So there are are so many different influences that can create coincidences in our lives. And, you know, we didn't have time to talk about a lot of these, but besides, you know, our ability to create coincidences for ourselves, um, also other people um, can, I've got several stories of this in the book. Um, other people can influence the world around us to create coincidences for us. So sometimes we can get tele- telepathic messages from people through coincidences. Um, a lot of people experience this with relation with um, a connection to their deceased loved ones. So they'll experience these coincidences that have a very strong person, a very strong relationship to people that they've loved and, and lost to death. Uh, and I try to present evidence in the book that some of these cases, at least, um, don't seem to be just wish, wishful thinking. They're, there is some evidence that they're connected to the consciousness of these people that goes on in, in some way and is trying to communicate with us. Um, so in the first part of my book, I lay out all of these different um, chapters about all of the different possible sources uh, that could produce coincidences in our lives. And so I think it's really important for people to be aware of the, the variety of possible explanations that are out there. But then I think it, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, the response that you have to these coincidences to to be aware of them, to, to think about them, but not to, to abdicate responsibility for your actions as a result, to, to take them as, um, 
food for thought to kind of, to help you think about parts of your life that you may need to devote more attention to uh, and to help you get straight about the way that you really feel about certain um, certain decisions that you could make for your future. Um, listening to your intuition when you're thinking about coincidences, I think is, is probably one of the most important things that you can do. If it, if it feels right, if it feels like a good and healthy thing to, uh, to take a certain coincidence as a sign of something that you ought to do, then it probably is. But if it feels strange and iffy and it just, it ties your stomach up in knots, then it's probably not, right? You probably haven't quite understood what's going on there yet. And you probably shouldn't just um, follow the coincidence blindly. Okay. So I, I know I said that was, you know, maybe we'll wrap it up, but I do have, you said that and that, that triggered something. If it's okay, I'd sure. just like to yeah, ask, go ahead. You know, I mean, it's just, I could keep talking about this all day, to be honest. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in your book, you mentioned at the beginning about a guy who um, who got married. No, no, sorry. The guy who um, was looking into getting a girlfriend. He he wanted to get um, he wanted to get a girlfriend, and um, he wanted to be with someone. And what happened was uh, his friends tried to set him up, but this girl was in a totally different state or something but there was a coincidence that they both ended up oh right yeah, yeah. And you you mentioned it at the end of the book as well but i i haven't quite got to that so i was just wondering based on that you said to because i think he thought he was having a I mean, you can explain it but he thought he was having a, a positive intuition um yes yeah so yeah, this is something that happened to stanislav Grof, who is um very big in the um well, uh, like in the altered states of consciousness, he's a psychiatrist who actually um, invented, um, along with his wife, the idea of holotropic breath work, which by certain breathing techniques can actually <sighs> imitate some of the experiences that people have when they're on hallucinogens. So in any case, that, that's kind of the background. That's who that guy is. But um, he tells... Um, this story about um, when, yeah, his friends were trying to set him up with this woman and he eventually decided, I, I guess he was going to a conference in Texas. He lived in Baltimore. He was going to Texas and he was like, well, I have to fly anyway to get to Texas. This woman lived in, I don't know if it was Georgia or Florida, somewhere down there. And he was like, well, I'll call her, you know, if she seems nice, then maybe I can like swing by, you know, on my way to Texas and meet her. So he calls her and she says, well, I'm not going to be home then. I'm going to be in Texas at a conference. <laughs> and it turned out that they were both going to the same conference. Uh, so uh, they ended up meeting there. They just, he discovered when he got to the conference, they had booked rooms directly above each other like the same room number on two different floors. Um, and when he got there, the conference was already in session. So he just went into this room where I think they were showing a, a film or something and he sat down in the dark. And while he was sitting there, he's kind of looking around the room and he noticed this one woman that just kind of seemed to have this aura about her. And so he was like focusing on her. And of course it turns out to be the woman that you know his friends wanted to set him up with. Uh, Joan was her name. So they end up talking and they just, you know, they just hit it off. It just seems like meant to be, you know, there's so many signs and um, it feels right to both of them. So if it, was, it was a matter of weeks, I think um, that they were, at this other conference uh, together in Iceland and decided to get married there. And the, their wedding had all of these crazy coincidences with rainbows, and, like multiple rainbows in the sky and all, all this crazy stuff coming together. But he says that he woke up the day after the wedding and immediately had the feeling that something was terribly wrong. And oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and he was like, I think, this might have been a really big mistake. Uh, what did we do? And he doesn't give details about what actually happened with the, the marriage falling apart, but they divorced not long after that. Um, 
And so I, yeah, I do try to talk about in the book, well, what, like, what's going on there? So one possible explanation is that, um, you know, they were supposed to get married, like, you know, they were supposed to follow those coincidences, but they weren't very good at being married. Like maybe they, maybe they messed it up. Um, you know, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe he had, uh, you know, a commitment phobia. And once he was actually married to this woman, you know, he freaked out. I don't know, but there could, they could have, maybe they reacted in a way to the marriage that made it fall apart. On the other hand, it may be that they were supposed to get married, but they, that was basically all they were supposed to do. They weren't really supposed to stay together for their whole life. Um, whatever the purposes of the universe were in bringing them together, um, they were accomplished in a very short period of time and then they both moved on to other things. I do have a whole chapter in my book about coincidences that seem to be linked to personal destiny and to a plan for people's lives. Um, and I think that, that that could explain what happened there. Sometimes, you know, we're meant to meet certain people and have a very intense um, interaction with them for a short time. Um, but we may develop all these expectations about, you know, how it's going to you know, last for the rest of our lives, or it's, you know, it's going to be this or that in the future. And those are just our own expectations. That's not what it was ever supposed to be. And that, so the coincidences could say, well, they were misleading them. Maybe, but maybe it was their own expectations that were misleading them. Maybe the coincidences put them in exactly the position where they were supposed to be, and then moved them along to some other place where they're supposed to be separately. I really, I'm, I'm very interested in that that last, that second explanation because, as you was as you were speaking, I was imagining a river, and um, you know, I'm going down a river, and and if I'm just relaxed, it's okay. Enjoy, I'm in my rubber dinghy, I can enjoy the ride, but um, I never see the necessarily see the corners coming, um, mm. and suddenly it switches. So it sounds like going along with what feels like reasonable, or you know, it's an aligned, intuitively good, or um, an intuitively okay coincidence sounds like the right thing to do, and um, but but then it's, it also means to be to to be relaxed and allow for not to attach to the changes that will never to be mm. never to become in life. Um, That's an excellent but, point. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it was it was what I got from listening to what you were saying. It was it was very interesting. Yeah, I think we ha we have to understand that coincidences aren't, I think they do have a purpose in our lives, but that purpose isn't to make our lives trouble free or, you know, make us live happily ever after. Uh, I think the purpose, well, if I had, if I had to say what the overall purpose of coincidences was, I think that they're in our lives to help us grow, to help us to right. become more aware and to help us, to help us love better not ne not necessarily in a romantic sense but just you know all of our relationships to become better at caring about other people and and experiencing deep connection to others mm. and it's not it's not going to be an easy journey coincidences aren't going to you know keep us from getting hurt and keep us from you know they're not going to make us rich they might make a few people rich, but most of us are not going to make us rich. You know, it's not like if we could just find the key to understanding coincidences, everything will be perfect. No, they're, they're there to teach us things, I think. And those lessons can be really hard sometimes. <laughs> but like you said, it's personal. And um, I, I really, that stuck with me, that, that point that it's personal lessons. And actually it makes me think, you know, we, we tend to think, you know, well, at least I do, I think most people do, in a dualistic way, you know, the good, oh, good, this is good, this is bad. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, it seems that what you're saying is it's, there is, at least you're pointing towards something which is beyond good and bad, it's, it's growth. And um, the things that come and go are, are not necessarily absolutely good or absolutely bad. It's just we're in a certain position at a certain point. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, I think we have to look at things in a more complex way and see what see what good could come out of the hardships in our lives because they can teach us as much as the the good times. Thank you. It's been really, really nice talking with you, and I hope I hope we get to talk again sometime. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. Yeah, this has yeah. been a very enjoyable conversation. I feel like you you really understood so much of what I was trying to get across in the book and it's very gratifying to to talk to you about it so thank you good no it was well written it was very easy to to to, to get that yeah yeah thank you thank you okay have a nice day you too thanks so much yeah Sharon okay so I hope you enjoy that discussion between myself and Sharon she um I, I was really I was really taken aback by some of the things that that she said she's it's easy to talk about things like coincidences in a very mystical way, um, which which can be um, can be important, I think. Um, but as as she she said, the thing I took away the most is that coincidences in our life are personal and they're meant for our growth. Um, this is I think this is a big takeaway message because as you'll see in her book. Um, if, if hopefully if you read it, the source and significance of coincidences, um, you can go, it's possible to go either way, like everything, there's a balance. So it's possible to say, oh, coincidence is one load of rubbish, even, you know, it's just like literally hitting you on the head and it's so obvious that, that something important is coming up. It is possible just to throw it away and say, nah, it's just, you know, let's discard that, it's just a load of rubbish. So, I don't believe in the supernatural, supernatural or the mystical. But actually, as a real scientist, a reality scientist, let's look at what's actually happening. You know, what's actually happening in front of our face? What does it mean? And I, I get the feeling that, that Sharon has done that very, very well, not only personally, but in terms of a scholarly report on, and, and on, on it as well. Um, so if we, one option is to blindly throw coincidences away as if they don't matter. Another thing to do is to take them as if they are everything and to sit back passively and think, okay, well, I'm just wait for coincidences to come. Or maybe even worse, kind of force them, you know, really look for them. Um, what that can do is to, um, to, we almost kind of relinquishing our need for, to make any kind of decisions in our life. And I think that's very dangerous as well, because I think we're active agencies. We're, we're people with, you know, a will. We, we have certain desires. And to, to just wait for coincidences to happen can be dangerous. And actually, Sharon talks about that in her book and obviously in the call we just had to some extent. So I'd like to thank her very much. And I hope we'll speak again in the future because her... Um, a lot of what she's talking about is very much aligned with with my interests in consciousness, mind, and matter. So, till next time, Harry Krishna. Ah.